Welcome to Thank your you. party. Uh, what uh, what we discussed before, and I think that would be good to talk about, just to kind of lay a, a, a groundwork for folks, is to talk about your basic operating philosophy, radical self inquiry. Right. What is that? <laughs> it's a clever marketing term uh, for therapy. No, just kidding. <laughs> Um, it's a term I coined, uh, I tell this, but I, I promise I'll try not to keep going, as I say in my book. Um, it's a term that came to me at one point when I was really frustrated, trying to explain um, why understanding the how of how to lead well wasn't enough. Um, it's a term that I came to literally in frustration as I was standing at a whiteboard, trying, which I often do, trying to explain a, uh, so, uh, something to a group of folks. When clients come in, they're almost always in a major anxious state. You don't reach out to a coach because everything's going well. And what they want to know is, how do I fire someone? How do I hire someone? How do I do this? How do I do that? And I typically will turn it around and start asking them questions. Questions like, what does it mean to lead well? What does it mean to be successful? What does it mean to fail? And what are the consequences of those things? And so for me, the term radical self-inquiry is a, a way to quickly define a process by which you start asking these sorts of questions. And the result is that you start to strip away the personas, the delusionary tales that you tell yourself about who you are. But you do so with compassion for yourself and with skill, with discernment, so that you're not hiding anymore. So that's what radical self-inquiry is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've used this phraseology before with you, but the idea, as I understand it, is that if you are in a position of power anywhere, mm -hmm. but in your context, in particular, uh, in, a, in a company, um, unexamined bag, and you have unexamined baggage, you just pass along your pathology all over the place. Yeah. And it just bleeds into the organization. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, this is, this is why I think this conversation connects back to the larger theme here. Um, we're talking about CEOs. We're talking about um, those who have role power or status power uh, or positional power in organizations. And when those folks who are in positions of power uh, aren't willing to do their inner work, aren't willing to look at the complex structures, the characterological structures that developed in childhood. When they're not willing to do that, the consequence is that we create organizations unconsciously that are designed to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. And we spread, perhaps, toxicity throughout organizations. And so, if you grew up, for example, with a belief system that the world is a dog-eat-dog, self-optimizing, you better get it yours before someone gets, it, gets to you, well, then you're going to create an organization that mimics that. And then you're going to wonder, you're going to call a coach and say, hey, nobody in the organization trusts me. Well, because you're not trustworthy. <laughs> You, you talk a lot in, uh, in our sessions about love, safety, and belonging. Yeah. As part of the idea of you know, sort of tapping into the primordial childhood version of yourself, uh, wh where'd you get this love, safety, and belonging thing, and what does it mean? Clever marketing again. No. Um. And I'm, I'm just a 10% <laughs> happier. I have no problem with clever marketing. <laughs> um. 
what I was reaching for was what what is it that we that's behind everything? You, you know, we've done this in sessions where I might say, so so Dan, what would happen then? What would happen then? You know, kind of like you know. What's next? What's next? When I ask about the consequence, what if I don't do this? What if I don't do that? What if I give up this job? What if I make that change? And I, I sort of usually get folks to really sort of boil down what it is that's really motivating them by asking that question. And almost universally, it's one or more or some sort of combination of what I would say, the wish to love and be loved. The wish to feel safe existentially, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And the wish to know where we belong. And yes, sure, if I know where I belong, then generally I'm going to feel safe. And if I feel safe, I'm generally going to be more capable of love. But I think early, early on in our, in our childhood, we are constantly reading the landscape. Our amygdala is constantly wired to say, am I safe? Are they going to kill me? Do they love me? And because of our wishes for those things, we then develop these characterological structures, these belief systems. Um, for those who might be an engineer in the room, a computer engineer, subroutines, programming subroutines that just sort of run in the background all the time. It might be, don't speak up, because when you were a kid, that was unsafe. Or it might be, anger is really, really bad, so it's better to be anxious than angry. And then we grow up, and we create these lives that are built on this foundation that is actually unexamined, untested into adulthood. And we find ourselves repeating patterns and patterns and patterns again and again, and not really we're not really sure why. Which always reminds me of the Carl Jung quote, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Want to know why you date that same person again and again, regardless of the meat bag? Or why you end up in the same job, regardless of the company? Because something's running in the background. So did you invent this whole thing out of whole cloth? Or are you borrowing <laughs> from Maslow? Or like, where, where is this? I borrowed everything from Sharon. <laughs> I mean, love, safety, and belonging seems like it comes out of Maslow's sure. hierarchy I mean, of needs. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that I invented anything, to be honest with you. Um, I'm a really good editor. Um, I think that uh, a lot of this stems from um, various explorations that I had to go through my own self in order to... Uh, begin the process of growing up myself. And so some of this comes from Buddhist teachings. Um, I have been studying with Sharon for almost a decade, dear. Wow. Um, but, but I took my vows as a Buddhist 18 years ago. I have been in psychoanalysis in some form or another since for t almost 30 years now. And uh, I have been studying organizations and leadership, first as a reporter, then later as, a, uh, as an investor, and then much later as a board member um, for almost 30 years. So I am not 100% sure where all this comes, <laughs> but I think the lineage goes in many different directions. It's not like, you know, you slept at a holiday in Les. <laughs> La Quinta. Yeah, La Quinta. La Quinta. That was, yeah. um, that's a commercial joke, but sorry. Marketer humor. Um, <laughs> but, but so the, these sessions you have, I mean, you, there was an article famously written about you in Wired magazine that said the man who makes founders cry. Right. The, these sessions get pretty intense. Do they? I mean. 
<laughs> Not with me. <laughs> I do remember what you called. We, Dan made reference to a 360. Can I just note something? You can note anything you want. So we okay. first met um, uh, just about a year ago when you asked me to help and do a 360-degree uh, performance review on his life. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've referred to it as an autopsy on a person who's still alive. <laughs> I also said that the subtitle for, the book, for my review should have been, you suck from every angle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I honor your bravery, dude, because uh, what did we interview, like 30 people? In no, 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 16 people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Bianca said he's better, right? Just marginally better. This year. Um, but my favorite reaction that you gave me was it was like a daisy cutter bomb into the uh, daisy cutter bomb into the bunker of your life. I just said daisy cutter. You started talking about the bunker because <laughs> <laughs> I asked what was it get what was in the bunker because that's interesting. I thought it was a, I was a very good client when you asked me that question and I said, none of your fucking business. <laughs> and I'm a really good coach and I didn't let you stay with that. <laughs> but so, uh, so take, is it take us in the room. Yeah, take us in the room. Well, I think opening up the bunkers is intense. It's scary. I mean, we, we lock these things away for a reason. Because it can be really scary. And that may, in fact, be one of the belief systems that we grew up with, right? Which is, shh, we don't talk about things. Well, yeah, you know. I mean, you know, as I talk about openly, I grew up with a, a mentally ill mom and, and an alcoholic father. And one of the things that was really difficult was that mom would be off in the corner talking to people who weren't in the room. But we didn't talk about it. Now what's crazier? That mom's talking to Bobby Kennedy? Or that the rest of us are just ignoring it? Right? So I suppose it's intense. Um, the, the crying thing. Can I say a word about that? Well, but, well, what am I, your editor? Go ahead. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. I don't set out to ha ask people to cry. But I believe that we need to feel our feelings. And I believe that many of us because we don't feel our feelings, the predominant feeling that we are not feeling is sadness. See, some people are in the room right now feeling their feelings. And there's something glorious about feeling our feelings. As I often say to a client, we don't get to cherry pick which feelings we want to feel. Please, I'll only have the happy ones, thank you. Please just give me joy. But in order to feel joy, you have to feel the whole Megillah, the whole experience. And sometimes the feeling the whole thing is hard. But then you get to be human. What does that mean? Oh, human beings are they're amazing. Look what we do. We get to feel alive. We get to create poetry. We get to create music. We get to create extraordinary experiences. We get to create love and safety and belonging. Right? Sure, we do harm. But I don't think that's the essence of who we are. So we get to, we get to become these full, actualized humans. There's Maslow for you. Right? This full person that we were... It's our birthright. 
And, you know, I'll reveal, you know, my, my, my Buddhist belief systems. The, the, the thing that released me from a lot of challenges from my childhood was um, a teaching, one of the sutras from the Buddha, which I interpret simply as this. I am fundamentally, basically good, and I know this to be true, because I was born human. What? I don't have to earn anything? I don't have to earn love, safety, and belonging? That changes everything. I am human. And human beings are capable of enlightenment. I'm not, but human beings are capable of enlightenment. And so therefore, basically, foundationally, fundamentally good. Entirely capable of evil. But fundamentally good. How much skepticism from your hard charging, charging type A CEO folks do you get <laughs> when? Every day. Yeah. Because you start talking about be human and uh, you're fundamentally good and it changes everything. And they're thinking, I would imagine, well, my sales team isn't functioning or, you know, my CMO is a shithead or whatever. Oh, um, good. I'm so glad you cursed. Now I can curse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Part of I get, being human, Jerry. I get this. <laughs> be human from Brooklyn. So, um, I, I look. I, I I get this kind of resistance all the time. You know, as Tim mentioned, I I, I started my career as a venture capital. Well, I started my career as a journalist, but eventually a venture capitalist, and then I was working at uh, J P Morgan. And What I often say is, well, I'll tell a quick story. A guy came to one of our boot camps, the CEO came to one of our boot camps, which is a, a leadership retreat that we lead. And the first night, I'm walking around without shoes on, which is normally what I do. And I'm reading poetry, which is normally what I do. And people are crying, which is normally what happens. And we're sitting in circle, and you can just see he's just like dying. He's in his body. He's like, Argh! and finally he says, what the fuck? I didn't come here to cry and read poetry. I came here because I have a greedy SOB head of sales and I don't know what to do about him. So I said, okay, Bobby, listen. Um, promise me that you'll stay by the, end of, and by the end of the week and if you do not know what to do about your head of sales, I'll give you your money back because I know how to talk to these folks. It's about money. <laughs> I should have offered him a discount <laughs> <laughs> on the next one, too, because that would be really good. Anyway, so he stays. Two days go by, and we start talking at this point. We're, we're in the process. We're talking about the, the Jungian notion of shadow, the disowned parts of ourselves that, as Carl Jung described, live in our, our shadow. And these could be positive qualities, negative qualities. And he just gets really uncomfortable and he scrunches up his face. I said, Bobby, 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 what's the problem? I don't understand. I said, Bobby, tell me about shame. And he just sort of looks at me. And he says, I was 13. And he starts crying. And he tells me the story of running away from home uh, he had an abusive stepfather, uh, being homeless, living under an overpass in Atlanta, and becoming addicted to alcohol. And he's just, he's feeling his feelings. And eventually I asked him, what was the promise you made to yourself? And he said that I would never be hungry. And so I said, Bobby, what is greed? If I have all the toys, I'll never be hungry. If I have all the money in the world, I'll be safe. I mean, this is a five-year-old's logic, isn't it? So I said, Bobby, you outsourced your greed. 
Who hired this character? Me. Why haven't you fired him? Uh, he's doing a good job. When we have power and don't examine these things, we will often outsource to somebody else within the organization all of the negative parts of ourselves that we don't want to own. And so the work with him became taking back that word greed and transforming it into the wish to not be hungry. Now we can relate to that. And releasing that meant that he didn't have to act it out or he didn't have to hire an actor to act out the greed. And we transformed the mission statement to include that everybody who works for the company has enough food to eat. Now, isn't that a great mission statement for a company? Oh, by the way, sales tripled in a year. Now, it doesn't always work this neatly. But how do you unlock creativity? How do you unlock the, the specialness of an organization? Let's get at the heart of what's really going on within the organization. Let me take a an attempt at uh, articulating mm. what you mean by the fully human thing. Yeah. Which is that we have all sorts, we're, you, the poem you once quoted to me, and I hate poetry, is <laughs> um, Walt Whitman, I contain multitudes. So we contain multitudes. We do. Uh, and if you're fend constantly just fending off parts that you don't like, a lot of busy work and, and then you're being owned by the stuff that's there anyway that you don't want to look at and that's the ghost in the machine that you referenced before, the sort of the programming that we're not seeing. Um, and fully human is just kind of being cool with all of it and uh, doing your best to let the better angels right. dominate within that context. You, on the first time you were on my podcast, said something like, I love who I am, and I'm a mess. Yeah. 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 And, and one of the things I like to do, you know the phrase namaste, the light in me honors the light. I like the mess in me honors the mess in you. <laughs> it's, it's much more real. <laughs> um, OK. I winced a little bit because I was worried that um, someone might hear what we are saying as license to just be a mess and to sort of flop all over and be toxic. No, 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 no. But if we really want to take responsibility and ownership for, the, uh, for our, our acting out, for the ways in which, which by the way, I think is a condition of adulthood, taking responsibility for our own behavior, then we have to actually acknowledge that we have that behavior. We have the capacity for meanness. We have the capacity for demeaning people, for hurting people. I understand that more often than not, it's rooted not in some broken, permanently brokenness of me or some evil that it has taken over me but it was probably programmed in as a child, as a defense mechanism. And the sweet move is to say, I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to bully. I don't need to hurt other people. I'm safe. Thank you, that part of me. Thank you for taking me into adulthood. But I'm good. I don't need to do that. That's part of that fully actualized, fully human person. You want to talk about the loyal soldier? Sure. So this, this is a concept that I first read about um, uh, by reading a book by uh, Bill Plotkin, who's a depth psychologist, Jungian depth psychologist out in uh, Colorado. And the loyal soldier concept, it's, it's a beautiful, brilliant metaphor. If you, if you remember the somewhat apocryphal stories of 
Japanese soldiers who held out in islands in the Pacific long after the war was over. There's By the way, I Googled this, and I think it actually may be true. It is true. There was yeah. one character who was found. He was in the Philippine Islands in the 1970s. Wow. Right. 1970s. And so for 30, 40, 50 years, he defended the homeland against the war that he thought was still raging. And what psychologists uh, have done is you have used that as a metaphor to define, to, to give an image to those belief systems that we adopt as children to protect us. I love this image. Because rather, see, one of the dangers of actually starting to unpack ourselves is that we start to use it as yet another um, source of self-loathing and self-criticism. Oh, look at me, look at what an idiot I am, blah, 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 right? But when we transform it and we say, oh, wait a minute, this was a loyal soldier, this was an attempt to keep me safe, or this was an attempt to make sense out of an insensible situation that I might have grown up with. And then we can learn further from the Japanese society, the way they responded to this person. Instead of finding them out and humiliating the soldier and saying to them, what are you, an idiot? Don't you know the war is over? We're at peace with America. They actually welcomed them home with parades and thanked them for his loyalty and very gently took the gun out of his hands. <laughs> to reassure him that the war was over, you're safe, you're an adult, and it was really scary We're okay. And you did a good job. But now it's time to be an adult. You've talked about your recipe being radical self-inquiry and radical self-acceptance. Sure. I, I don't. I've said that? said it on my first time you were on my <laughs> podcast. I have it on tape. I, I must have said it. <clears throat> Fake news. Um, <laughs> I had to slip in one of those. Um, yeah, I think that the, the self-acceptance part is incredibly important because, as I said before, as we start to unpack these things, we can often use them as excuses for reinforcing an old loyal soldier belief, which is that you're not worthy. Right? By accepting that we are, in fact, messes. Isn't that great? We're messes. By accepting that fact, we don't have to defend against it. We don't have to feel shame. We don't have to make other people feel badly because we feel badly. We can just say, we're a mess, and I'm going to do my best every day. And tomorrow, I might have to do it all over again because I might mess up today. So that's, that's where those two things come from. No, I mean, I found it because you know, post 360 I've had, it's been a year now, a lot of shame, especially at the beginning, about the stuff that was turned up. Mm -hmm. And your technique is you shine a light on it, but not without the shame. It's like, let's look at this. It's interesting. But the bad boy, you know, bad dog thing, newspaper on the snout is not part of the deal. And I think it's really useful. I, I, I don't think that's how the dog learns to not pee on the carpet. Uh, you know, wrapping people on the nose. I think that that, I, I think that love, love works. Compassion works. You know, we have this teacher here who teaches <laughs> us all about loving kindness. <laughs> right? We don't. Do you use discernment and insight to understand the way in which we are operating in the world only to beat ourselves up. That's not the point. Trust me, I tried it. <laughs> 
So how do we operationalize this? You said before that you're not uh, um, accepting that you're a mess, honoring your own mess, bowing to other people's mess, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't mean you're flopping around and right. um, bleeding out all over the place and telling everybody your deepest, darkest secret. So how do you be fully human to your, your terminology without being like incredibly annoying? <laughs> well, we have another year to go on that for you. <laughs> Right, Bianca? <laughs> um, I don't know about the not being annoying part. I think, because some people might find this annoying, but I think that if we can define annoying as like spreading toxicity, spreading, especially in organization structures, in our communities, in our societies, if, if I am taking responsibility for me, and I am with, you know, in my Buddhist lineage, we often talk about, talk about the warrior stance. If I am taking responsibility with a warrior stance, where I am accepting the totality of myself, and every day, and Sharon taught me this word, with remorse and regret, not guilt, and vowing to learn every day, to be marginally better every day. Imagine if all of us were doing that. Especially those of us, I mean, here we are, two white men. I'm cisgendered, right? I mean, those of us who hold this kind of power, if we took responsibility like this every day, I don't think that's particularly annoying. I think that's, that might, in fact, alleviate some of the suffering that's going on in the world. Well, I don't disagree with the latter part of that. OK, so disagree with the former. Uh, it's not that I disagree. I just have questions about how to do it. And I can imagine ways in which being uh, you know, oversharing your mm. own messiness and all that stuff. It, could be annoying. Right, right, right. So, so let's talk about in the context, say, of an organization, right? I'm not suggesting that uh, we turn every business meeting into a therapy session or even a coaching session. Um, what I am suggesting, and I was talking to, to some folks before I said this, what I am suggesting is what if we started each meeting just acknowledging that we're having trouble right now. Like, you know, hey, it's Monday morning. I just want to let you know that I had a fight with my life partner this weekend. I'm feeling really depleted. So if I'm a little short right now with you, that's what's going on. There's nothing to do with you. That's it. Rather than trying to defend against that feeling and sort of blocking it away, and then we go forward with our work, and then the other person's like, boy, that crap jerk today. I don't understand what's going on. Let me polish up my resume and move on. And then they come home and they take it out on their life partner and then that person takes it out on the kid and it's like, well, stop. Just take responsibility. Hey, I'm having a hard day. Okay. I'll give you a little space. And then we move on. That feels very adult to me. No, it does feel adult. I just... I, I just think about, uh, especially when I was more junior at ABC News, or I'm looking at my wife who works in clinical medicine, as mm. do my parents, which is a pretty hard driving, formal in some way world. To start a meeting that way, it would, it would be very countercultural and maybe not super successful at the beginning, unless you were the person in power setting the tone. Ah, you just said something I think really important. What if those who are in power set a tone and modeled something different? What if those who held leadership positions actually said, it's not just my responsibility to produce profit, but to create humane working environments so that the best of us can thrive? And by the way, there's research to show that as psychological safety goes up, in other words, 
the ability to speak freely without fear in a t on a team, that those are the teams that perform the best. Especially over a period of time, right? Leading through fear can produce extraordinary results in short bursts, but at what cost? And the best people will leave if that's the sustained model. But if, we, if a leader, if someone who's holding positional power models using the challenges of leadership to actually complete their own process, then this magical thing happens where it becomes safe for everybody within the organization to start to do the same thing. So for those of us who are listening who aren't in, in you know, aren't the CEO of our organization, mm. um, maybe we're individual contributors or right. junior, how can we operationalize the wisdom you're dropping here tonight? Well, it sort of depends on the position that the person is in, right? So if the person is, say, at the beginning of their adult career, um, by understanding some of these forces at work, they can start to unpack their own reaction to the conditions in which they're working. Um, and what, what pops into my mind is something uh, that my son Michael, who's now 22, once said to me when, we were, when he was 13. And I, I, he and I had gone to the movies and um, there was a scene in the movie that was very, very upsetting to me and it brought me back to childhood and some experiences I had as a kid and I just broke down in tears and I was a mess. And uh, you know, the lights go up and dad's still sitting there crying and he's 13 and he's like, what is going on? And this is uncomfortable. And finally he says something really magical and, and brilliant. Uh, he said, dad, you might as well tell me what's going on because if not, I'm going to make shit up and it's going to be negative about me. And I think that's what we do. When those who have power don't tell us what's going on, we make shit up and it's about us. And so the flip side of that is to begin to understand that when you're encountering that toxicity, we know this is true, what I'm about to say. We know it's intellectually true, but to feel it. Hey, wait, maybe it's not actually about me. Hey, wait, there may be something going on over there. And to just pause and not do what we did as children, which is to internalize the suffering we see as our responsibility to fix or ours to have caused in the first place. And that's one thing to operationalize, to use your term, that we can do early in our career. It doesn't mean you're not responsible for what you're doing, because you could be doing stuff that you ought not to be doing. It's time to grow up. But not every negative feeling in the workplace or your community or is, in fact, a reflection of how broken you are. And that little jujitsu move can be really a lifesaver. It puts me in mind of uh, something that we talk a lot about in our coaching sessions is the issue of safety. Yeah. Um, you said something to me uh, two sessions ago about, you know, Dan, can't you just um, realize you're safe just as you are, which is such a Jerryism. Um, <laughs> and I and then I came back to you the last time and said, well, uh, what does that mean and how do I do that? And uh, I don't remember what you said, so you can you say it again? <laughs> in what way does it keep you safe not to remember no just kidding <laughs> I hope I didn't use the phrase can't you just <laughs> probably didn't, probably didn't. Oh, it, it does remind me of what my uh, former psychoanalyst Dr. Sayers may she rest in peace used to say to me alright Jerry you are crazy <laughs> there, are you happy? <laughs> um, what was your question? No. Uh, <laughs> it was something about you are safe. I, I, think, I think 
And by the way, you, you also said to me at some point in the last few weeks, boy, because he's been reviewing, he's been recording our sessions and, and reviewing the transcriptions, which totally makes me feel unsafe. Um, well, actually, I carry with me, I'm you working. You not have documents over there. <laughs> I'm working on a chapter of my next book, uh, and it's all about this process, this part of the process, so it's right here, and I'm, you cannot see it. <laughs> But when you said that to me, it made me realize that what I'm probably doing is projecting my lack of safety from childhood into our conversations more often than it may be. So I'll acknowledge that that may be going on. Yeah, actually, but can I interrupt you for a second? I Please. apologize. Uh, when you started talking about love, safety, and belonging, I was like, this is some bullshit. I'd have no idea. Like, I, <laughs> none of this means anything to me. But over time, I, the, the safety thing became really interesting to me because I, I was, we've discussed, I had a pretty healthy childhood, I would say. I mean, not, there was no violence in the home and, um, that I can remember. There was uh, no physical violence. No. no. And I don't remember much emotional violence either and it was a, just an intact middle class upbringing in a leafy suburb, very privileged um, in, every, in almost every way. Um, so I didn't really resonate with the safety thing. And yet, as we, over time, we talked about, you know, did my, the Jewish side of the family escape the Cossacks? Yes. Did my great-grandfather have financial worries and kill himself in the kitchen? Yes. Um, uh, do I spend a lot of time worrying about where I stand at work and how much is in our bank account and et cetera, et cetera? Yes. And so, so safety is a big deal as I started to examine it. Okay. So I don't think you were projecting on inappropriately is my answer. Okay. So can we just acknowledge that actually he said something really powerful and important right there? And he said it in a Dan way, which was quick and quippy. <laughs> right? What he's talking about is intergenerational trauma, which leads to belief systems. And there has been plenty of evidence, read The Body Keeps Score, there's been plenty of evidence that shows that multiple generations back, the fears that they experience can actually create chromosomal changes two or three generations out. And so the norm in the family, in this idyllic leafy suburb family, is to worry about money. Mm -hmm. My parents, this I recall, didn't use the heat in the winter. So we sat around and- What an idyllic <laughs> childhood. <laughs> Please tell me more. <laughs> I walked to school uphill both ways. <laughs> Freezing. <laughs> Your it wasn't like that, heat. but it was like they were really flinty, and so like they didn't turn. And the what heat did up they do for high. a living? Physicians. Yeah. So they were really, really poor. N no, but interestingly, I grew up. We grew up in a wealthy town, and we were not that wealthy. My parents drove like sh shitty, you know, sh brown. Uh, that Plymouth Valiant uh, <laughs> and a gray Chevy Chevrolet, uh, Chevrolet or whatever, the sort of hatchback piece of shit. Um, uh, and so I had this running dialogue of... Not having enough. Yes, yes. And what was one of the main issues that you came into coaching about? Bianca, you remember. How many jobs do you have? I had three, now I have two. And why do we need to have three jobs? You know, when you're this awesome, you're in demand. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you know when there's a leak in the roof and you look at the ceiling spot and you go, oh, that's where the leak is and the leak is actually over here? Why do you have three jobs? Why do I have no time for my family? Why did my parents not turn the heat on in the winter? 
What happened to great grandpa? Or grandpa? Lost Head a fortune. In the oven, yes. And killed himself. Didn't even lose a fortune. He was a poor Jewish guy, but he lost what he had. Yeah. This is what we do. We take those stories and we interpret them. We interpret them. I have a client who History 60 came back and said, the problem with Mike is he can never c celebrate. He can never relax. He can never, like, the company went from 15 million in revenue to 50 million in revenue to 150 million in revenue, and he's still not satisfied. Driven, 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 driving his employees crazy. Right? Great grandparents survived the Nazi pogroms. And here is the message he got if you relax, the knock's gonna come on the door. You better not relax. Now, how can you celebrate if you can't relax? The leak is there? No, it's there. You didn't answer my question. How do I feel safe right now? Always, in per perpetuity, et cetera, et cetera. Forever and ever. You're the one who said, you, why can't you realize you're safe right now? Are you I, safe in this moment right now? Very much. Okay, what makes you safe? I like attention. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> <laughs> what, so if, the, if, the, if they left the room and the attention um, wasn't on you? Uh, what makes me safe right now? I was kidding. I mean, you're people. talking about some pretty deep personal things, and yet you feel safe. I don't know the answer to that question. What are the conditions that you need to feel safe? This puts me in mind of the, you were asked this once by your shrink and you said as much money as Bill Gates. Right. Who I don't started? actually think that. I don't know the answer. Hang out with it. I mean, what would, by the way, this is kind of, we just slipped into coaching. Um, <laughs> You'll get a bill, um, <laughs> which he won't pay because he's too busy not paying the heat. <laughs> no, I convinced my company to pay you. <laughs> That's right. It's all part of the book project. <laughs> Everything needs to be monetized in order to keep me safe. You laugh, and that's an interesting joke. It's, it, that's an interesting thing because one of the, is there anything about that belief system that might in fact actually stand in the way of you having happiness or love and belonging? Yeah, like a million things. Like what? I don't know. I just said that. Um... Pick one, <clears throat> not a million. The wish to be safe, how might that actually get in the way of, say, love? Uh, well, let me think. Let me, uh, one of the things in the 360 was that I can be very short with people. Right. Um, and I think one of the things that I came to in working with you is I didn't understand why I was doing that other than just like impatience, arrogance. But it was linked to, I think it is linked to those things. And um, I have these ingrained ideas about standards of excellence in my work. And if I feel that somebody's threatening them, I will let them have it. And if so that's those sort standards of are threatened, mm -hmm. what happens to your, to, in your mind, what happens to your physical safety? The five-year-old thinks it's, it's up for grabs. So when you're short with people, you're protecting the five-year-old in the five-year-old belief system that I have to have two, three jobs and be constantly busy Correct. with real, in Correct. order to ward off what happened in the past. Yes. You see the complexity here. Um, perhaps the antidote, perhaps the wish for, to feel safe all the time could be transformed into the ability to feel and to, to feel 
that you can love and be loved. Say more about that. When you're short with people, perhaps it's not loving. Yes, I would agree with that. And if you lean into the part of you that is capable of loving, because he's actually kind of loving, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen it, dude. <laughs> If you lean into that part of you and feed that part of you, perhaps it's not that you'll be safe forever, but perhaps the need to feel safe will dial down a little bit. Why are you such a good coach? I am hogging all of the airtime here. I would love. <laughs> I, think, I think what would be nice is to let other folks ask some questions. Yes. Because we do have time. Yes. Thank you for that, by the way. Yes, thank you. So there are mics. Uh, do you want people to come up or raise their hands? No, no, we'll, we'll, um, we'll get the mics to people if you raise your hands. But I just want to I see uh, just say uh, again hello to those of you, if you've just joined us watching on Facebook Live, we're discussing Jerry Colonna's uh, reboot, leadership, and the art of growing up which uh, very adroitly, as we've just um, come to understand, implies that the answers are not always what um, is needed, but the ability to work with the questions uh, as a starting point for growing up. Mm. So um, thank you both for that um, really you. beautiful and heartfelt example. So uh, we've got time maybe for 20 minutes of questions. We've got a hand right at the back, Zaley, if you don't mind, on this side. Anybody on this side of the house right now? Yes, in the second row, Kurt, if you don't mind. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. This was remarkable. Um, my name's Catherine Powell. I'm a law professor and a former uh, Obama White House official. Hi. Hi. And, um, we met on Twitter. <laughs> I know. I tweeted you. Um, so I wanted to ask about gender and I wanted to ask about power. And um, one of the things I research is about women's leadership. And when I worked in the Obama administration, we invested in women and girls worldwide because we found that when you invest in, women, in girls' education and women's empowerment, it helps to grow economies, it helps to lead to better security, longer term peace in conflict situations. So there's a business case to be made for investing in women, women's leaderships, right? It's not only the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do, as we've heard people say. So I wanted to ask you a bit about diversity in and leadership, whether it's gender or race or other forms of difference. And the other question was really about power and about hierarchy, because I'm a law professor. I work in a very non-hierarchical situation. We're all our own boss. But when I worked in government, it's like it's very hierarchical. The president is the commander in chief, and you just give the order, and it's like, you know, it just operates on down. So I wanted to ask about, um, is it good to have hierarchy in the workplace in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, creativity, unlocking all that? And it really relates back to the initial question about gender and about forms of difference when we think about power and hierarchy. Thanks. Thank you. I'm so glad you get to answer that question. <laughs> That's such a smart question. It's great to see you, Catherine. Um, Here's what I think about in terms of, let me, let me speak to hierarchy first and then circle back to the gender and, and can we expand that even to talk about uh, identity however one identifies with a kind of openness around that. Uh, uh. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of and proponent of uh, what has often been termed servant leadership. And I believe wholeheartedly, there's a little fun little thing I do, whereas I'll jump onto a whiteboard and I'll draw a triangle and I'll say, what is this? And you know, eventually people say, oh, that's an organization structure. And I say, great, who's at the top? Right? And it's almost always um, El Jefe, right? the boss. Or it might be, and it, it's oftentimes um, uh, uh, identified with a masculine tone. But in the end, I, I joke and I'll say, you know, well, it's God, right? Like, who's at the top of that pyramid? And we often talk about the limitations of that as a structured way of growing. And so this, the, here's a business case why that's a challenge. It doesn't scale. 
In fact, most of the time I get calls from clients who are completely freaked out and, and in pain because they put themselves at the top of the pyramid and think it's their responsibility to have all the answers, to be perfect all the time, to, be, to, to, to have what Parker Palmer, one of my teachers, calls functional atheism, a kind of just like I know all the answers. And so I suggest flipping the pyramid and asking those who have power whatever the source of power, asking them to hold a question, what do those around me, what do those who are around me need to thrive? And that creates a very, very fluid and uh, terrific organization. And that works really well for about 80% of the time. Because there is a role for hierarchy. And it goes like this. Fire! Everybody out of the room! That's a hierarchical statement with someone who at a moment has positional power to say, here's, what's, here's an emergency. But when that, the problem is that's overused and inappropriately used and it crushes people. So that's thing one. Gender and identity. And again, I'm speaking from this body. And this body has a very, very limited perspective. What I have observed is that those who identify as female tend to live in a double bind. Uh, you know, I can get up here and speak a good game about authenticity and being real and showing up with your feelings, but if you come from a uh, marginalized social location, the risk is intense. And I don't think that there's enough language, there's enough discussion about that and that, that challenge associated with that. Would you tailor your advice if your client was a female of color or maybe just a female? I, w the, 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 to me, as a, I'm, I feel fortunate that I'm a coach and not a theoretician. So I get to say, let's talk about your specific situation and your specific experience and your specific circumstance. And so then, of course, all advice is tailored in that way. But it took me a long time to understand that the things that I would encourage, say, men to do didn't necessarily work in all circumstances, either a person of color or, or a person uh, who identifies as, as a woman, or someone who identifies with, with a, a kind of non-binary fluid experience. It's a very different experience. And so my responsibility then is to get damn curious and reflect back as best as I can. And I feel like I didn't answer your question, Catherine. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, we had another question here, I think. Yes, just in the second row, Kurt, please. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I mean, how are you doing? Good. Thank you for an incredible night. Actually, uh, my life coach brought me here tonight, so thanks for <laughs> bringing me here, too. <laughs> you got your coach, I got mine. <laughs> so, um, actually, I just recently became the CEO of my company, so thanks for the great insight tonight. It's been incredible. Um, you referenced the childhood many times tonight, the leak, the story about your father, about having that belief that something was wrong with you because of him being quiet. Do you have any suggestions to the audience tonight about you know, digging back into that childhood? Because there's a lot of memories that I have that I'm conscious about that in my last three years, I've been, I'm in recovery actually for the last three years, and in my last recovery I've gone back to a lot of those conscious moments to understand, oh, my dad was a certain way. Finally, I accepted him today, and, and it's made me go to the next level. But I feel like there's so many obstacles that I still have that are deep in my subconscious that I'm not able to bring to the front and address them. Is there any suggestions you have um, you know, to try to go back into that childhood so that we can start to face these, you know? Could I have your first name again? I mean. I mean. Yeah. Thank you. This is just an intuitive response, but be gentle with yourself. Yeah. He needs to do that, doesn't he? 
Go slowly. When you start to unpack, the impulse might be to rush and unpack it all. Easy. We go slowly. We take our time. You just said a, a really important thing. I'm in recovery. Well, part of the rec recovery mode is to actually let your body rest. Let your emotional body rest, too. So you unpack. You made an association with your dad. Perhaps you can see the ways that the relationship with dad or who he was is showing up in how you believe you ought to be as a leader. Yeah, that, his eyes just went bang, you know. So we start to see that. Maybe you do a little journaling. Maybe you go for a walk in a coaching session, right? Maybe you pull up a good friend. You say, you know, hey, this is what's happening. And lastly, the one thing I, I would wish for you to remember is you're not alone with this. I don't know if you could feel it, but there are a number of people who are nodding their heads and recognizing the experience that you had. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we've got, uh, all right, uh, we'll go right next to you, sir. Um, Kurt, if you don't mind, uh, the gentleman right next to you. Yo, um, this is one of my former students. I like the whole, like, and war we'll of the there, warlocks we'll mind meld with the other life <laughs> coach. <laughs> well, this, this is what coaches do. We right. find each other out, you know. <laughs> Uh, Jerry, Yo. thank you very much. Great to see you. Good to see you again. Um, first, congratulations on the book. Thank and uh, it, was, it, was, it was actually really a great conversation. Um, so could you share insights into um, active listening and how, and how active listening um, can make a person a better leader? Can you define active listening for folks? Um, I, I used to be his college professor, so. Okay. And, uh, and actually, <laughs> and my brother, brother also. That's actually, it. it was his brother, and he just crashed the course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> true story. It's true. Dan Daniel was like, I've got a brother. He's got to listen to this. <laughs> and Queens never built me for it, which is great. <laughs> um, so so uh, active listening, um, being, being genuine and present with the, with the people that you're, that you're having um, a conversation with and, 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 and actually lending an open ear. Um, because and so your question is, how does that impact? Uh, um, well, well, actually, how does a person um, improve on those skills? And then also, um, um, you know, what about that makes them um, a better leader? Also, how can that uh, actually impact the people around them as well? Mm. What did you notice about what I did with Amir? What do you notice that what I did, Joel? I'm asking you, Yehuda. What did you notice about uh, what it was, I... It was, it was a heart-to-heart. Um, you know, and what was the first thing I did? We often don't even pay attention to people's names. Start there. You know the secret to the question to, to, that, uh, that, that behind my, oh, there's Ray. The, the secret to when, when I get people to cry. <laughs> it's a true story. I ask them a very, very complex question. I say, how are you? Only I actually mean it. And I don't put up with bullshit. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah. Stop. Like, how was your breakfast this morning? If you have kids, what was it like getting them ready? Did you sleep well last night? If you woke up, what were you thinking about? Now, you don't have to answer any of these questions, but to just Bring your attention in. Now, I, for me, I, it's kind of what I do, right? By the way, my, my daughter, hey, Emma, she's probably on Facebook right now, um, hates, you know, as she once wrote on Facebook, can you imagine what it's like growing up with a dad who asks you these questions all the time? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm rolling my eyes, Dad. Um, But imagine taking the time to actually care. 
Remember before what I said about human beings being cool? Every one of you are interesting. I can't hear all of you, but every one of you is interesting. There's another human being in the room. You could actually talk to them and just be human together. Hey, what's your name? That's all. So I, I think I answered your question. If I didn't, too bad. <laughs> Hi. Hello. My Hi. name is Ariane. Hi. Dan, I want to thank you so much for your podcast. Oh, thank you. You have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So I came to find your podcast through the Minimalist podcast. Like yeah. you mentioned in one of your episodes, like your podcast became very well known through after they released their Netflix um, documentary, which I yeah. haven't watched, but I have listened to every single podcast by them and by you from zero. Wow. <laughs> so um, I actually came to know about this event by accident because by accident I played um, at Spotify and I jump into your episode with Jerry, this latest one. Um, and then that's how I came to know about this. So it's like random coincidence. It's like my life is full of like magical realism. Mm. Um, <laughs> so uh, I actually wrote down everything that I wanted to tell you so that I wouldn't forget. Uh, <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry, everyone. You're gonna make um, me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I have a very deep question and that's why I wanted to just give you a little bit of um, inside of why I have that question. I live a very normal life, um, as normal as it can get. Uh, quiet family, I spend a lot of time on my own because my mom and my, most of my, uh, I was raised in a matriarchate. So my mom and my grandma were working all the time, so I spent a lot of time on my own. So I grew up interested in the things that I didn't know best, but they were the, one, the stuff that I were interested on. So I felt my emotions, I felt my feelings all the time. So that actually made me feel the black sheep of my family, because mm. I was the not normal um, one. So, um, so my, in terms of my feeling, my biggest deceptions on everyone is that I thought I had to expect things out of people. And it was due to my character, I have a very strong A++ alpha, extra, extra female, um, to the point that people find me intimidating sometimes. And, and so my emotions dragged me to a, a very dark place where I thought that I had to control my demons. And what happens when you shut down your demons? They get louder. Exactly, and they come after you. So what I did is I, I opened my door and I let them roam free. So right now, instead of shutting them down, I actually listen to them and they coexist with me every day. The good and the bad ones. And I'm totally fine with that. One time someone told me, you have to tone it down. You are too cheerful, you are too bubbly, you are too nice. And I was like, why? So instead, I tune it up. And I work in a very hierarchical, very formal place. So to me, today, I, was, I went to a different office and one of the ladies told me, that, oh, here comes Ariane. It, it, she's loud and we love that. And because the first thing that I do when I go to the office, I walk up and down the aisle saying hi to everybody. And I felt, to, I felt the need to express myself inside that hierarchical place. And I build my space, and even though I'm young, I, I, I always encourage my team the love and kindness to express themselves. And I go and ask them, so what's your idea? What are we going to be doing now? Tell me. And I go one by one, because I want them to speak up. Even if they have nothing to say, but I wanted to do something, because I want to inspire other people to live, to live life. To, to, to feel inspired, to feel motivated. Every time when I go, when I walk into work, I see like a bunch of meat going into the factory mm. to get shopped off. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm walking in the same direction. Mm. Am I right? Am I supposed to be running in the other direction? Like, what am I doing? So, and this is uh, my question to you. It's like, how do you live life? How, what's is there something? No, I know. I know. Um, um, what's out there? Is this it? Is our life? Is this it? Uh, we were born to like 
struggle and study and work and travel and then that's it. Um, you know, and I get about the love and kindness and I try, oh God, we all drop on so much baggage on other people that we don't even know about because we just had an awful day and we woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And sometimes I tell to my boyfriend, it's like, I cannot stand myself today. Just mm. don't talk to me. It doesn't work. Mm. Um, so what's there? I mean, I'm very skeptical. Alignment to me, forget it. But I, when I was too young, I ran into a Buddha um, book. So that messed up very bad. Mm. Um, and then I did a lot of yoga, which is also didn't help. But, and, and my question is like, is this it? You know, it's like, is that... Is that something, life is, do we grab it? How do we go about it? Jerry. Good luck. <laughs> also, you have 60 seconds. I have 60 seconds? <laughs> um, the first thing that occurs to me, tell me again your first name. Ariane. Ariane, thank you. You are not too much. There is a beautiful posting on Facebook, um, which you'll have to Google to find. We just invented two new words, right? Facebook, anyway, called the too much woman. You are not too much. And the short answer to your question is, no, that's not all that it is. We're not all just meat on a factory going into the office. Your instinct is right. I think the question for you, the answer to you is actually a question back to you, which is what is your life to be? I can tell you what I would do. He can tell you what he, she can tell you what she would do. The question is, what are you going to do? Then you have your answer to your question. <laughs> You will be too much for some, and you will be just right for others. Thank you both. We have time for one last very brief question. Sorry. That's OK. That's OK. But just know, and, and I'm sure so many, I see already sort of many copses of forests of hands going up. But just know that both uh, Jerry and Dan will be upside, upstairs um, signing their books. Um, and those of you who have um, been very antsy waiting for Dan's uh, fifth anniversary edition of 10% Happier will have to make do, I'm afraid, with Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics, which will be incredibly appropriate for you if Dan, <laughs> uh, you're feeling that sort of anxiety. Um, so Dan will be signing that, and of course Jerry will be signing the book we've been talking about, um, about leadership. So yes, one last question. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Jim Conley, and um, hi, Sharon. I, um, I teach a program called Mindful Awareness Training when I'm not being a banker. And um, something that you said earlier to Dan, um, when, I, when I teach emotional literacy, mm. um, you go through the stabilization the four scopes of mindfulness that you stabilize, then you turn it outside and do compassion. Well, you know, it takes a narcissist to know a narcissist. Mm. And one of the things that when you're operating from a perspective of pride or narcissism, that small self that he was talking about, you know, you're not doing it my way, my way or the highway. Would you, would you join me in calling that a, like a, a bit of a narcissistic tendency? I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not following the question. Okay. 
So when you um, when you have a narcissistic position, or or you 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 uh, engage from a perspective of pride, okay? When when I do it, or when one does it. When one does it, okay. That causes at the subconscious level you lean in mm. to somebody, and you you're pushing a little bit. When Dan was saying a little while ago that you know he gets he has a short temper, I'm speaking from experience. I did too. You tend to impose. When you impose, you 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 impose from a position of pride and narcissism. And until you can lean back and disengage, you know, with the other person, would you call that narcissistic leaning in, or what? How would what would you label that as? Well. Are we, we're talking about Dan's behavior. We're talking about Dan, yes. <laughs> talking about Dan. I, I, it was literally a clarifying question. I think Dan self-identified it as arrogant. Well, that's, yeah, it was arrogance. But wouldn't, would you back into a narcissistic tendency, this my way great. or the highway? <laughs> would or I no? do that <laughs> yes. with him? That's the question. I might. I might. Um, in order to engage with that piece. This is more, it feels like a technique question. Um, okay. But I might not. I, I'm, I'm having trouble, and it could be a re resistance on my part, I'm having trouble rocking the essence of the question. Okay. That's fair. Okay. So let's rock Cheers. some other time, shall we? <laughs> yes.